the law. Find out by staying with us for The Law Game, a program in which three well-known personalities compete with each other in betting on the results of law cases. And here to preside over the legal proceedings is your chairman, Shaw Taylor. Good evening. Well, the law game deals with fictitious situations we've dreamed up that would have led to people being involved in court. Uh, actual cases dealing with the same points of law did take place, and our judgments will be based on those. Our resident repertory company will be acting out each of the dramas till the point where I stop them with his bow. And then the panel, who I would generously start off with 50 points each, can bet as many of those points as they like on who they think won the case. I will match the bet if they pick the winning side and give them odds of two to one if they can also give me the right legal reasons for that decision. Legal experts may notice our court procedure is speeded up somewhat, but that's because we want to get three cases into tonight's show. Our panel held over from last week by public remand are <laughs> Sandra Dickinson, Matthew Kelly and Fred Housko. Last week I was asking you if you had any brush with the law at all. This week, let me ask you, have you got any laws you would like to see enacted? Have you ever said to yourself there ought to be a law against that? What about you, Fred? On a light-hearted note, there's a guy who's got a cabaret act where he stuffs ferrets down his trousers. So I believe that <laughs> ferrets should be protected. Um, <laughs> on the serious side, licensing laws have got to be changed one day. I, I love the Irish idea where they close from two till three and they ask you to have a drink while you're waiting for them to... <laughs> Sandra, what about you? Is there any law you would like to see enacted? Anything you'd like to see well, a law against? I'd like the law of the 70 limit on motorways. Oh, Reversed yes. Back to the old days when it was sort of clear sailing. I must confess, I find the 70 miles an hour dangerous from the point of view that a steady 70 miles an hour sends me to sleep. It really does, yes. sitting behind the wheel. Yeah. If you can do 80 or 85, or I'm alive. Or if you can vary it a bit, you know, 110, 65. <laughs> <laughs> you know. I think I followed you up to Birmingham last week. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew Kelly. I'd actually like to change the law of gravity, that we could all float about a bit. <laughs> Don't you? I think I'd better move on to the first situation. It concerns a photographic equipment shop in Manchester who had a notice emblazoned across their window proclaiming closing down sale. It attracted the attention of two local government officials who called at the shop to talk to the lady manageress. Are you Mrs. Fisher? Yes. My name's Granger. This is my colleague, Mr. Arkwright. We've come about your closing down sale sign in the window. Oh, yes, it's all marked down. Um, were you looking for anything in particular? We're not, customers. We're making an official inquiry on behalf of the council. <clears throat> Just when are you planning to close down? Well, I don't know the exact date. Uh, that's up to the owners. I'm just the manageress here. How long have you been working here? Um, well, not very long. About six months, I think. And do you know how long that notice has been in your window? No. It's been there two years. <laughs> and there's been no sign of you actually closing. In fact, we've checked and there's another seven years left on the lease. Tell me, who does your advertising? Well, it's all done from our main offices in London. Including this big display advert in the local gazette? Oh, no, I put that in. You did, did you? You don't know, Mrs. Fisher, the terms of the Trade Descriptions Act 1968. Well, yes, more or less, but uh, well, surely there's nothing illegal in that ad. Isn't there? It clearly says closing down sale. Price is now slashed to, and it lists seven of the items you have in your window. Yes, and what's wrong with that? I'll tell you what's wrong with that. You've been selling those same things for exactly the same price for at least the past two months. And the law states that, as a general rule, in order to be legally advertised as marked down or slashed to, as you said, they have to be offered by you at a higher price for a continuous period of not less than 28 days during the previous six months. And so they were. Oh, look, there's no use lying to us, Mrs. Fisher. We've been keeping an eye on your shop for some time now. And at no time have those seven items listed ever been offered in your shop at an higher price. So, not only are you trying to fool the public by pretending to be closing down, but you're also using that as an excuse to falsely advertise a non-existent reduction in your prices. You couldn't want a more blatant violation of the Trade Descriptions Act. Now, just a minute. 
If you gentlemen had been a bit more thorough in your investigations, you'd have found that everything I've listed as being reduced was offered at a higher price and for at least your precious four-week period in our London shop. It's all part of the same chain. Now that's over 200 miles away, Mrs. Fisher. The same customers were unlikely to either see it or have ready access. Well, that's not my concern. Look, as far as I can see, my prices are genuinely reduced from the ones charged by us in London. And that may be your interpretation, but I'm afraid we're not convinced by it. I must warn you now, Mrs. Fisher, our legal department will be issuing summonses against you and the shop's owners for conducting an advertising campaign that contravenes the Trade Descriptions Act. Now, from what you've heard, would you have found the defendants guilty or not? Matthew, I'll start with you. Do you think they were guilty under the Trade Descriptions Act? Well, I love Mr. Arkwright. He's a lap a minute. <laughs> yes, <laughs> see. It's a funny thing about this sale business, isn't it? Mm. There's a couple of shops I know that have had closing down sales for as long as I've known them. Right. From what they've said, if the Trade Descriptions Act is actually anything to go by, and it means anything, then under those terms, she would have to be found guilty. Even though they had a shop in London selling things at the right price before they were knocked down to sale price? Yes. I think that's just a red herring. You find that she would have been found guilty, or at least the shop would have been found guilty of contravening the act? Yes. Fred Hasker. Can I pass on this one? <laughs> <laughs> um, seems a bit odd, actually. It depends what they mean by the Trade Descriptions Act. Um, closing down. I don't suppose you had a time limit on it. I get the impression that they might be able to do on the question of not reducing the goods in the shop for the specified 28 days, but they're actually sort of nicking a simply for advertising a closing down sale when there's no determined limit, and I don't think she is guilty. They were also finding her for slashing prices, and they say that prices must have been at a certain level to be slashed for a given period of time. I think I've seen in some shops where they say, as advertised in other branches, which may be the, the get-out. So, you find for her and her company, sound of that leaves you, my dear. Do you think well, she got done or not? Well, as a sucker for sales and bargains myself, I think it would be very nice if she had got done, because I think we need to be protected from losing all our money at the first available opportunity. And I'm going to say that she got done. Okay. Two of you, that's Sandra and Matthew, find that she was found guilty, or at least the firm was found guilty under the Trade Descriptions Act. <clears throat> Fred, you're out on your own. You say, no, they got away with it, and you gave very good reasons for saying so. Let us now take your bets. Matthew, you first. You've got 50 points to start with. What do you reckon? 20 points. 20 points you will go for. Yes. Well done, that man. Fred, I'll take yours next, please. Yeah, 20. You'll go for 20 as well, will you? Okay, fine. Sandra, you have 50 points to play with. You're along with Matthew. You say they got fined. Cut the brooch in half. <laughs> I'll go for 10. You'll go for 10, will you? All right, fine. Well, was she found guilty? Was she not? Mrs. Fisher and her bosses were found to be not guilty. <laughs> The court held that, firstly, the closing down sale sign did not in itself constitute a breach of the law. It was not a false statement as to the nature of a facility provided in the course of a business at that shop. And the fact that the prices had not altered in that particular shop did not amount to a contravention of the act because the same owner, trading under the same name, had offered them to the public at the higher price for the prescribed period of time at his London shop which all adds up to the fact that they got away with it. And Fred, you were right. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to give you your uh, 20 points, which makes you 70. Matthew, you're down to 30. Sandra, you very wisely only bet 10. <laughs> so you're down to 40. Fred, you're in the lead. Let's go on to our second case. This is one that takes us into court, and it concerns a man named Thomas Bellamy, who is facing a retrial on a charge of manslaughter caused through reckless driving. The first trial was abandoned because the judge was told that eight members of the jury had been sent copies of a newspaper clipping showing a previous conviction for dangerous driving by the accused. But this retrial, six months later, has one important element missing. We'll find out just what that is as we listen to the counsel for the prosecution addressing the court. At this point, Millard, the Crown intended calling the witness to the accident, Mrs. Celia Logan, to take the stand but the lady has herself been seriously injured as a passenger in a coach accident. Then why did you not ask for a postponement, Mr. Dickens? I was hoping that she might have recovered by now, my lad. 
Her physical injuries are much better, but yesterday I was given a psychiatrist report from the hospital saying that the blow she received to the head has left her with a disability that would make it difficult for her to clearly understand the court's questions and for her to be able to give precise answers. You think it might have impaired her memory? Mm, the report rather suggests that, my lord. Oh, is she the only witness the Crown intended to call to support its case, Mr. Dickens? Unfortunately, she was. Then can you see any reason why I should allow you to waste the public's money or the jury's valuable time in continuing with this case? The accused has pleaded not guilty, and you do not appear to be able to prove otherwise. With respect, Millard, the Crown would still like to continue. Though our prime witness is not here in person, she is still here with us in substance, so to speak. I do not follow you, Mr. Dickens. I have copies of the transcript of the first trial, the one that had to be abandoned because certain information was passed to members of the jury. The transcript includes Mrs. Logan's original statement to the police after she witnessed the accident. She stated there clearly what she saw and her impression of the manner in which the accused was handling the vehicle he was driving. My intention is to read the transcript to the jury, my lad. I see. Miss Welton, as defense counsel, do you have any objection to that? I do, my lad. Mm. Without the witness herself being here, I will be deprived of the right to cross-examine her. But as the court will hear, my lad, she was very thoroughly cross-examined by the counsel for the accused at the original trial. He was a most experienced barrister, and I doubt very much if my learned friend will think of any questions that were left unasked. Maybe not, my lad, but... Merely quoting the words of the witness rather than hearing her say them herself is surely just hearsay, and therefore not the kind of evidence that should be admitted to decide such a serious matter as manslaughter. The actual charge in this case is of no consequence in considering whether I can allow this unusual form of evidence to be admitted in my court. I am inclined to the view that since it was given under oath, and the defense had ample opportunity to question it at the time, I shall allow it. Thank you, Millard. I will begin at the point where Mrs. Logan is answering my question about what she actually saw at the time of the accident. I was on my way home from shopping at 11.15 that morning and was about to cross on this zebra crossing. I stepped off the pavement and a car coming from my right pulled up to let me pass. When I reached the island in the middle of the road, I was in two minds whether to continue or not. That was because I saw this old blue Cortina coming towards me at a faster speed than it should. I would say it was probably going at about 50 miles or more an hour, and it seemed to be swerving about a lot. So for safety's sake, I stayed where I was. But this nice old gentleman, the one the driver killed, that is, he was on the pavement waiting to cross towards me. He stepped onto the crossing. Any normal driver would have seen him and stopped, but not this one. He carried right on and plowed straight into him as though he wasn't there. The poor old man didn't stand a chance. The driver stopped up the road and came back and said it was the dead man's fault for stepping onto the crossing without looking. And he had a funny smell about him. I felt sure it was drugs. So I went straight away to the police station and reported what I'd seen. <coughs> Now, oh, Pamela, let me tell you this. At the first trial, the accused driver had called Mrs. Logan a liar from the dock. At the retrial, he again insisted it was all lies, but nevertheless, he was convicted. So he appealed on the grounds that Mrs. Logan's evidence, as read from the transcript, should not have been admitted. Did the conviction stand or not? Now, you're sitting as appeal court judges now. Is there anything there that makes you think that that should not have been admitted as evidence, a statement from a previous trial? Fred, you're first to go this time. The driver sounds like a diamond, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, no, I think, as it was taken under oath, the driver himself hasn't actually changed his evidence over the two trials. No new evidence was produced or appears to have been produced. I think he, the um, appeal would have been turned down. I you think do. he would have lost an appeal. All right. Sandra. Well, it seems to me that because the woman is not there, mm. that the, the appeal should not go ahead because... Well, now, that was a second trial. The appeal was to decide whether or not it was right in law that the judge should have admitted that statement from the previous trial as evidence. Well, I think that he got off because the woman was not there. Right. 
and that it should not have been used as evidence because the whole first trial must have been faulty to some extent to have an appeal. Right, so you feel that you would, you would vote for the fact <clears throat> that he was found not guilty because that should not have been admitted as evidence. Yes. Matthew Kelly, what do you think? Well, w witnesses are notoriously unreliable. I was involved in a case myself where I was a witness to an accident and three of us had witnessed the accident and all three of us gave completely different stories. Mm. And we were all convinced we were right. I don't see that she would have changed her story. I don't see that uh, it would have made the slightest difference. You think that was acceptable evidence? The appeal should have been rejected and he will be found guilty? I do, yes. All right, so you find Sandra uh, for the man. You think he got away with it. Matthew, you also go along with Fred and find that he was convicted and guilty. So, Fred, your, uh, your bet's first, sir. Oh, You've got 70 points to bet. <laughs> After listening to Sandra, who won last week, I have decided that whilst I can't change my mind, I'm going to bet about five. <laughs> <laughs> All right, five. Sandra, you're well, the odd girl out. Yes. 40 points you've got. What will you bet? I think I'll go for 20. Matthew, you're along with Fred. You've got 30 points to play with. You find him guilty. I've had 15 points. That gives me... Uh, that's half of what I got, isn't it? That's true. Oh, yes, yes. It would, if you were wrong... It would leave you with 15 points. I think that's ample to cover the next case, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> but in fact, you were right. His appeal was dismissed. The guilty verdict stood. Brilliant. So you and Fred were right. <laughs> Good night. You remember I said it was all to do with whether or not they would accept that transcript of evidence uh, given by witness at an original trial a transcript of evidence given by a witness at an original trial is admissible as evidence at a retrial of the same defendant on the same charge if the witness is too ill to travel to court ah. this lady was too ill she'd been in an accident yes. herself she couldn't be there so they accepted the, uh, the statement instead so well done let's have a look at the score Oz, Fred, you're up ahead there, mate. You've got 75 points. Matthew, you're second with 45. Sandra, you've got 20, but you never know. We've got another case to come. You could still win. Final case tonight arose because Mr. Geoffrey Marsh was digging in his garden and he found the remnants of an old Roman pot containing 209 coins from the 3rd century AD. He was naturally very excited. He tried to sell them to an antique dealer who called the police. They said the coins were crown property of under the laws of treasure trove. So Geoffrey Marsh and his wife Vera sought advice at their local citizen Advice Bureau. I realise you didn't know what you were doing, Mr Marsh, but you do know the old saying that ignorance of the law is no excuse. Yes, but even solicitors don't know half the laws. That's why they have to call in barristers to advise them. Yes. It's all jobs for the bullies, isn't it? Yes, but the rule of thumb is that the laws are based on common sense and are there to protect the interests of the public. So in general, anything you do that interferes with the public interest is considered to be illegal. Oh, yes, but Geoffrey was just trying to sell some old coins he found in our own back garden. I mean, how can that be against public interest? You tell me that. Because they were treasure trove. That means they belong to the Crown, and the Crown has the right to preserve them for the nation if it wants to. Of course, you could receive a reward up to the amount that the coins are judged to be worth. And if they've already got thousands and don't want them? Then your reward could be small, but your mistake was in concealing the find. Quite apart from the fact that this is an offence, it could lead to a considerable reduction in your reward. Assuming, of course, that the coins are treasure trove. Well, that's taught me a lesson. Next time I find any buried treasure, I'll bury it even deeper and forget it altogether. <laughs> and what about all those broken bits of pot the coins were in? I suppose I'll come round and take them and all. No, no, you're quite safe there. You see, treasure trove consists only of gold and silver. And that brings us back to the coins. Go on, we're listening. As I said, treasure trove is gold or silver, coin, plate, bullion, found hidden in the earth or other private place with the owner being unknown. So? The coins you found were not wholly silver. Well, they couldn't be, could they? I mean, even I know that gold and silver are too soft to be made into coins on their own. They have to be mixed with another metal or they'd never hold their shape. Mm. Hey, you mean that gold sovereign my mum left me isn't really gold? Not entirely, no. no what a Pure gold is 24 carats. 
Gold sovereigns are only 22 carats. I heard Fred Ausko say that on Mastermind. <laughs> Uh, you tell me, Mr. Marsh, that those third-century Roman coins were examined and found to contain, at most, 18% silver. They're only the size of an old farthing, so they can't be worth that much anyway. Still, we wouldn't turn our noses up at any money. I'd be satisfied to get this matter over with, never mind about the money. So you've definitely decided to fight for the coins rather than just 